I'm going to walk through um, some basic instrumentation information and then um, start the first of two parts of a case history on Blakely Mountain Dam. So learning objectives, um, we're going to talk about different types of instrumentation that help monitor different failure modes. We're going to, um, you know, the objective is to recognize the importance of appropriate instrumentation reading frequencies. That's a big soapbox. Susie's got a lot of soapboxes. Um, and then also learn uh, through the Blakely Mountain case history about um, the importance of having reliable instrumentation um, and confidence in your data. And then just a quick outline. So um, this question from Ralph Peck, um, this is a question we should be asking every time we consider adding instrumentation to one of our dams or levees. Um, what information can we collect and what question can be answered with the installation effort? More importantly, what information do we already have that can help answer some of these questions without conducting costly and, um, you know, potentially uh, schedule impactful uh, investigations? So above all, consider justification for new instruments uh, with the premise of do no harm to the structure. That's a big deal in the core Amy talked about. Um, the unbelievable amount of hydrofracturing we did to the core of Abiquiu Dam. Um, and that's not uncommon across the core portfolio as it turns out. So we don't want to do that anymore. Do no harm. Remember that. Um, in a risk-informed dam and levee safety program, understanding the risk-driving potential failure modes and having an instrumentation program that monitors for these failure modes is key for any project. And also having confidence in the data collected is equally as important. Um, I just wanted to throw this picture of Ralph Peck in. I had the opportunity to meet him. Um, he was an uh, emeritus professor at University of New Mexico, and one of my geotech buddies invited me to like a brown bag lecture that he did on some interesting work he did um, in the city of Chicago in his early career. And my buddy brought me up to meet him. And when he found out I was a geologist, he got very excited. So that's one of the cool things about Terzaghi and Peck and others of that kind of group that was learning and working together is they absolutely under, understood and appreciated the importance of um, knowing your geology and knowing your foundation. So um, I also, I didn't mention this when I started, so I'm not intending to go through instrumentation in any great detail. I think based on conversations this week um, and, and people's relative amounts of experience, um, we don't need to get into the details of instrumentation per se. So there's a lot of good references out there. If you're interested in more, there's good um, courses, uh, both out in industry as well as within the core for prospect. There's a great instrumentation class. If, those haven't taken it, I would, I would absolutely encourage you to do so. Um, and, and feel free to ask questions on breaks. So this is a quick list of typical signs of distress and conditions to monitor for dams and levees. For projects and design, teams should consider the potential for these conditions while designing an instrumentation and monitoring program. And then during a risk assessment, teams should consider um, observed uh, distress, we've talked about that this week, adverse performance um, when evaluating your failure modes. It's really, really a huge part of what we do, or it should be. Um, teams should also consider adding targeted instrumentation to better understand uh, failure modes as well as monitoring for their occurrence. So this is uh, just kind of a quick typical list of instrumentation found at dam and levee projects to monitor groundwater and seepage, deformation and instability, and to help inform hydrologic and seismic loading. Projects will typically have a complement of existing instruments and monitoring points, and teams can utilize data from these instruments to help understand event-specific and long-term performance. When a team initiates a risk assessment, it will need to collect all project data including any and all information on the existing instrumentation. All historic data will need to be compiled. We've talked about that this week. Plotted, reviewed, and interpreted. No sense in doing all that work if you don't understand what it means. Um, the team will also need to consider functionality of instrumentation, and that's kind of where this case history with Blakely is going to go. Um, and if there's confidence in the data. So what is an instrumentation program? It includes not only the instruments, but also includes the staff that collect the data in the field and to post-process and evaluate that data. Uh, Army Corps projects um, should have a surveillance and monitoring plan um, on the books um, that describes these instruments, um, uses historic data to evaluate past, uh, past performance, as well as establishing thresholds uh, levels that, and what actions are required when thresholds are exceeded. I think my computer's about to self-destruct in the back of the room. 
Um, so put this table together as kind of a quick reference, um, and we've used it in some other workshops as well. So this is a typical um, instrument, typical list of typical uh, instrumentation found at dam, dam and levee projects, and which failure modes they can help inform. Um, so it's not intended to be an exhaustive list of instruments. It's the common things that we use. Um, so bear in mind that conditions at each project are going to be unique, and existing instrumentation will also have some unique. Um, components. Um, as you can see, certain types of instruments have broad applicability um, and can help inform many failure modes. Pisometers are incredibly versatile instruments. Uh, spend a lot of time working uh, with these types of instruments. They um, can help inform initiation and progression for internal erosion failure modes um, and inform uplift for instability related failure modes. Uh, in visual monitoring, we, we kind of don't always put that into the bucket of instrumentation, but that's key. Uh, it's part of the part of that overall um, uh, situation. So it's key for each type of failure mode and should always be considered when you're researching historic performance during flood events. I mentioned that on day one, high water flood reports, memos that are buried in somebody's files could be incredibly helpful in understanding how these projects have performed over time, especially on levees, because levees aren't often heavily instrumented. Uh, so we, we have a lot of gaps in, in performance outside of what we see visually on levees. Um, gauge data, river gauge data, is also universally important as it helps inform hydrologic loading, uh, loading for and duration of spillway flows, and potential overtopping events. And then this is kind of looking a little more specifically at seismic uh, failure modes. So um, these, these are typical instruments that you'll see at projects um, with uh, dams and levees, but mostly dams, with seismic risk uh, in which additional um, seismic failure modes that can help inform. Um, so seismic instrumentation um, can include strong motion instruments that help monitor a project's performance during a seismic events and seismographs uh, that help monitor seismicity and form seismic loading. Um, and as you can see, there are many instruments that are useful in informing uh, seismic failure modes as well. So talking about visual monitoring, um, this statement is geared towards the importance of uh, visual monitoring of a project during normal and flood operations. Um, teams should always familiar, familiarize, bless you, themselves with past performance um, and complete a site visit to become familiar with the project. I got into a little bit of an argument with one of my mentors in Albuquerque District when we were working to automate Abiquiu Dam, and he was very concerned that if we took the project staff's boots off the ground and when they would read an array of almost 60 pisometers that had to be read monthly, um, that we would remove their visual observation. Um, so we had to develop a protocol to ensure that we got the guys out on, on, the, on the project weekly, um, even in normal operations, just to ensure that we were, had boots on the ground and eyes on the project. Um, so never underestimate the importance of notes and photos from high water monitoring events. Uh, this information is often in the form of inspection reports, but can also be found in trip reports or less formal daily logs. Um, those are the ones that are harder to find typically, but worth the effort. Um, so you should make an effort to locate any and all instrumentation um, and project documentation and look for uh, reports of past performance, poor performance, including seepage, boil activity, cracking, sloughing, settlement, just to name a few. Um, adverse performance uh, can also be added to project drawings to help understand causes of distress. Uh, so some of the things that Amy showed us on ABIQ, um, where we were overlaying uh, multiple pieces of information to understand Where's the seepage coming from? Where is it exiting? And how does, how does that relate to what we're seeing in our instrumentation? So it's not uncommon to have data gaps. Um, you've heard a lot about that this week as well. Uh, and certainly in instrumentation, this is a challenge, at least in the core. Um, it's not unusual to have very little to no data um, or information on project instrumentation. Um, time, this time history plot here um, is showing uh, pisometers for only um, is the only record we had available um, for the time shown, one year. Um, and I think this is for Abiquiu Dam, actually, uh, which Amy talked about yesterday. So these instruments were read manually, uh, and the original instrument readings uh, could not be located. So there's a hard copy somewhere where Buddy was out there in the field and he was recording these water levels, um, but we could not locate it um, in our files or in the archives uh, for, in the case of Abiquiu. Um, we were missing field sheets that represented about a 15-year data gap at a project that we had a lot of concerns over seepage. Um, and this was during first filling, so these were early performance records. 
And um, I don't, I'm not certain if we touched on this, but uh, historically speaking, um, in terms of our internal erosion failure modes, most dams fail at first filling um, for internal erosion failure modes. So that information, that early um, monitoring data is key. Um, so there are, these graphs are useful, to, and they do help inform uh, project performance, but they cannot really be um, added into your digital instrumentation databases um, because they're skewed. So um, kind of a slight joke, I tortured, not really, um, a handful of interns in Saint schools in uh, Albuquerque District when we were working on Abiquiu's project, and we were trying to get this information plucked off of these um, time history graphs and put into our database. And um, the young engineer that helped me do this initially um, said he never wanted to look at instrumentation again. So that was kind of a failure, but he did well in construction, so it's okay. Uh, but there was a two um, foot plus or minus skew on the data. So we had to be careful when we were looking at that information. You can do it, but there's a bias in there, right, with how that skewed data is pointed off the plots. Um, and so we have that information plugged into our overall time history charts. Um, but we have to be careful when we look at that early data. Um, so often when we're trying to understand the project's performance, we have questions regarding the functionality and reliability of instruments. Having all the available data and background uh, information on the instrumentation helps uh, capture both uncertainty and also inform recommendations. Um, yep. So a little note on reading frequencies. Um, this is a huge pet peeve of mine. Um, I was just on a PA in Texas where we have some unusual, um, we had a slide at the dam during construction. Uh, we had high pore pressures and some really bad acting clay shales, not a respectable rock. Um, and there was a lot of disagreement about what the data meant. So if I told you that we were only taking readings at that project quarterly, how confident would you feel in all of the time in between those quarterly readings about what was going on? Because seepage through clay shales, it happens. It's just real slow. So it was a challenge. And we argued quite a bit in the room about how do we get operations, which is, are the people that are responsible for our dams, um, to pay more money to increase the reading frequency or try to improve the reading frequency at those projects. Um, so this chart is an example of um, three minute daily and monthly readings. And so you can see um, here um, in the upper, let me get this straight, I always get these straight. So this is tailwater down here. And in each plot, we've got tailwater, we've got, um, I think this is your instrumentation reading, and the, and, the, and the graph on top is your pool. So you can see the three-minute daily readings give you a lot of definition in what's going on as the pool is coming up and going down and as your tailwater is reacting as well. Um, but the straight lines in between, those are those monthly readings. And so you're missing a lot of detail. Um, so I wholeheartedly encourage uh, scrutiny when you're looking at historic instrumentation data. You can't go back in time and fix it, but you can certainly inform recommendations to improve and have an appropriate reading frequency. You may not need three minute, that's a little aggressive, um, but you may depending on the type of project you're monitoring as well. So what reading frequency is necessary to achieve the adequate level at your project? Is it variable? This is a plot, and I already mentioned all that, blah, 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 read my notes. Um, so. Um, just bear that in mind. Um, it's a discussion you should always have when you're in a risk analysis and you're scrutinizing um, your instrumentation data. Um, it's different for different types of data. So if you're looking at settlement data or horizontal movement data, um, you should have the discussion about reading frequency, but it certainly might not be as touchy a subject as pisometers can be. So let's talk a little bit about bias. Um, so this is a crust settlement survey data for a Rockville Dam. Um, the movement, there was movement of the embankment that was recorded um, both during and post construction. So historically, the construction and dam safety um, staff thought there were errors in the surveys. And so what you see in the early record is they would survey it and then they'd survey it again and they'd survey it again and the results always came back the same, but they weren't buying it. They just thought there's something wrong with the survey data. There's no way that dam is moving upstream. So um, 
had a bias. Um, when, uh, if the data were to be trusted, um, it showed progressive settlement and lateral spreading in the upstream direction. I remember my mentor saying, dams don't move upstream. And I'm like, that kind of looks like it is when you look at the data. Um, I didn't win a lot of friends uh, in those discussions. Um, so additional review of the survey data was we actually hired a contractor and we dumped all our historic survey books. We had them inspect all of our benchmarks out of the project, make sure that they were not moving because that, that's something you need to check. Um, and um, what they concluded um, was that the data was reliable. Um, and so a, a semi-quantitative risk assessment was done at this project. This is Santa Rosa Dam in New Mexico on the Pecos River. Um, and so we did conclude through that risk assessment with an external risk cadre out of Savannah District um, that there was settlement and there was lateral spreading early in the project's life and that this was actually worsened by um, rapid drawdown operations. So at the time that Santa Rosa was being topped out, they were building Brantley Dam downstream, which was a reclamation dam. And we would use Santa Rosa as our diversion and care of water, which is a terrible idea. So we would let it kind of hold the water up. And as soon as we had a chance to flush the, the stream, you know, the bed um, down uh, downstream of the dam, uh, we would let it rip. And we weren't following curves, you know, drawdown curves that would ensure that the structure wasn't deforming. Um, so um, that deformation over time, as you can see in these plots, so this is showing um, across the dam stationing, and you can see these are these those early um, surveys, and then you can see this progressive deformation over time. Um, so it's if, if if you were to see things that were kind of zigzagging back and forth, or you were to ascertain that your benchmarks were actually not stable, um, you might have a different outcome. And then this is showing each um, survey uh, marker, crest survey marker um, over time, uh, and so you can see that that deformation had plateaued. Um, so, as part of the risk assessment, we uh, did some slope stability analysis and we actually provided a drawdown rate so that we didn't see this happening again. Um, so, we didn't want to see any additional settlement or lateral spreading. So, the point here is you should always consider the prevailing hypothesis at a project. Um, the, 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 what the designers and the dam and levee safety staff have to explain instrumentation and observed performance, they often prove true. So I'm not saying you should be a skeptic for the sake of being a skeptic. Um, however, there's inherent bias in everything we do. So um, be, be aware of your own bias and the bias of the local teams you work with. We've talked about that a lot this week. Um, it's important to keep an eye and um, keep an open mind and to question whether or not the prevailing hypotheses are defensible. And, and one thing I like to say is, and you've heard me say this this week uh, amongst discussions is it's not important that you are right it's important to get the right answer um, so check your ego at the door is what i like to say um, and i will offer that when the risk assessment was done we went through all the review process we presented it to sog um, pleased to report it was the first dsec five in the core woo -woo. Um, but the point being is i talked to my boss about it who was also part of this group of folks that didn't think this survey data was accurate. He says, I don't care what you guys came up with, that survey data is wrong. Okay, well, whatever. So I'm gonna go ahead and segue into a case history. So I'm gonna do this in two parts. Um, so Blakely Mountain Dam, um, the project, uh, this was a project that Amy Lefebvre and I worked on. Um, I was an advisor on the project. This is located in um, about 10 miles northwest of Hot Springs, Arkansas, and located within the Wachita Mountains. Um, it's an earthfill dam with a controlled outlet works, a powerhouse and related structures, and an uncontrolled rock cut spillway. So just a real quick, I don't think I have notes in here on why we were doing a risk assessment in the early, well, I might get ahead of myself. We had concerns over potential hydrofracture related to a piezometer flushing operation. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the site geology. Um, this uh, slide here is showing the, the, the site geology as it was known during design. The dam is founded upon early um, to middle Ordovician sandstones and shales. <clears throat> and I'm pleased to report this is probably the most messed up geology I've ever had the pleasure of working on. Um, those Wachita Mountains began forming uh, about 340 million years ago, so it's quite an old mountain range. Uh, and it was actually related to the formation of Pangaea. Sorry, super nerd, always got to bring in the, the cool geology factoids. Um, but the point there is the, princip the principal geologic feature of the dam foundation is that formation, the formations are folded at the dam and they're actually overturned. 
So in this cartoon, you can see the folded rock and you can see that it's actually overturned in the downstream direction. And this is a cartoon showing where Blakely sits. Um, the photo on the right. Um, so uh, just real quick. So you've got an overturned and thrust faulted anticline for you geologists in the room. And this actually strikes nearly parallel to the dam. Um, the photo on the right is a picture of the rock on the upper right um, abutment of the dam. And it calls it shows some small scale deformations. Right there um, at the project in the rock um, and <laughs> locals call this geologic bacon. So that made me kind of happy uh, at our first site visit. Would you just say geologic bacon? Okay, so that was kind of what we had uh, looking at the design documents. And this is a more recent geologic map showing uh, that's courtesy of the Arkansas Geological Survey. While this map uh, is much more accurate than the version from 1950, um, the overall structural trend is similar. So you can see we've got Blakely Mountain sitting here, and this is that um, overturned anticline in plan view. So um, they had it pretty, pretty right on when they did the original uh, work on the project. All right, so these are plan profile and section um, that help illustrate the complexity of the structure as well, the structure at the, in the foundation, um, as well as the general orientation of overturned beds. These are striking nearly parallel to the axis of the dam. Um, so you can see here, this is, um, I believe, cut along uh, where we put the power tunnel in. So you can see that while we've kind of had that uh, more cartoonish view of the overturned and thrust faulted anticline in, in, in reality, whoops, um, what they were seeing was a bit more complex. But this is running kind of across from, you know, abutment to abutment. Um, so you can see uh, we've got sandstone layers interbedded with some um, shales. Um, you can see the plan view here. Uh, this is on the left abutment, and this is actually along um, the uh, kind of the main valley section in the valley underneath the dam. So this is a copy of the foundation, um, the project foundation map showing orientation of over, overturned and uh, deformed sedimentary rocks. And I want to note that there are springs that are showing up here in blue. Um, there was two cadres that worked on this dam, um, and so our group picked it up. Um, on the second go around. So can't take credit for this. This was done by the prior group, um, but I think it shows some inf interesting information. So those, those springs are shown in blue. Um, and what's interesting to note is they do follow a similar trend. So you've got your rock, you know, kind of striking across the valley this way. Um, and you've got quite a large shear zone here. Um, and then um, you've got a lot of kind of, I would say, accessory fractures and small scale faults that are, are more uh, perpendicular to the structure. Um, so those springs collectively flowed about 1500 gallons per minute uh, during construction and they required installation and pumping of dewatering wells until the dam was raised to about eight feet. So for treatment of the core, this is a construction photo that we found. And I know it's a little hard to see, um, so check it out on your uh, on your uh, PDF copies. But what they're doing is they're they've got these troughs. This is along the dam axis, and they're they're clearing out these troughs. You can see some pooled water, likely related to either uh, precipitation or those springs that I mentioned, um, and they're compacting material within these troughs. Um, so they're minor troughs. Uh, I think they might have been maybe upwards of a foot in depth. Um, some much smaller. Um, so a question to bear in mind is, could the initial lifts of the embankment placed along these troughs have the potential for low stress zones? So uh, typically when we think about low stress zones, we're looking for upstream to downstream continuity. But I just want everyone to kind of bear in mind in terms of the geometry, um, we could have some very small scale uh, potential low stress zones um, where they compacted this material between the what I call rock ridges on the floor. So um, just a typical cross section of the dam showing the central impervious core in purple here. And then what they did is they had random fill shells and they attempted to, <clears throat> excuse me, grade the material um, from finer to coarser as they went out to the outer shells. Um, and they also had a, um, a, what we called the gravel drain just downstream of the core here. And that gravel drain um, went moved to a rock drain, and then that went into. Um, uh, initially, it just exited into the downstream reservoir. There's a re-reg hydro uh, reservoir just downstream. Um, so there were concerns um, about being able to 
monitor any seepage. Oh man, I never get through these quick. Thanks, Dara. Um, and so the, the, the district constructed an, uh, a seepage collection system. And so they took uh, the lateral drains that were coming out of that system. Sorry, trying to do the booper here. Um, and they constructed, they extended these pipes. They all came into a common man, manifold that you can see running around here. And they exited out of a, a single seepage weir that at the time they were able to not only collect flow measurements, but also um, look for turbidity. So again, they were concerned that they couldn't monitor any of the seepage exiting the toe of the dam. So they, can, they did this as a modification. In terms of instrumentation, um, the dam was constructed with a system of twin tube hydraulic piezometers. This system was used to monitor the pore pressures in the embankment from 1953 to 1974. Um, and you can see the trench that they excavated here. This is where they put that um, tubed system and you can actually see the teeny tiny uh, lines right here. So uh, not surprising that those didn't hold up over time. Um, so readings for this system were abandoned in 1974 because it became, had become unreliable. And I'm sure of the cause, um, many of the numbers became suspect at best and for, and um, the um, piezo levels in the closed system were higher than the pool levels. So they started to grow weary and thought we need to do something to, um, to replace that. But I'll get to that in another slide. So in 2006, the intent was to grout the piezometers in the upstream shell and core. The piezometers that were actually grouted ended up being much more random. So issue with oversight in the field, perhaps. Um, during design, the piezometer numbering on the project drawings was changed. And um, a superseded drawing was used during uh, the grouting operation. So they didn't have the updated numbering system. So they grouted the wrong ones. Oops. Um, so they grouted those incorrectly and those are shown. What was grouted um, is shown in green and that uh, what should have been grouted. So I got that right? Yeah, incorrect grouting for the piezometer shown in red on the section. So that was a little bit of a ch an interesting aha. Uh -huh. And that was a result of digging through project documentation that we discovered that. So uh, what they did is they knew, um, this is Vicksburg District in the core, uh, they knew that they needed to have uh, an, a monitoring system. So this slide shows a plan view of project instrumentation. Um, in 1973, three open standpipe piezometers were installed at the toe of the dam um, and to monitor pressures in that downstream drainage blanket or gravel drain. Um, and in 1976, additional open um, piezometers open piezometers were installed in the embankment and at the what we thought was the embankment foundation contact um, to replace, um, and, and actually we thought they were in the foundation, so I got ahead of myself, um, to replace that closed system. So these are P1 through P10 on the map. And in 2009, uh, Vicksburg District automated these instruments. Uh, so this is a um, cross section of the embankment in the upper right showing the open piezometers and a time series plot of the piezometer data. So piezometers that are installed in the upstream and downstream shells, the core, and at the core foundation contact and in the blanket drain, um, the phreatic surfaces of these embankment piezometers and foundation piezometers are also shown on this section. So you can see um, those reflected here. Um, in 1980, all of the piezometers at the project were flushed with water. Uh, there is no written documentation of this process. Um, we do not, what we do know is that the, a garden hose was used um, to pump water into each instrument from the surface, and that pump capacity is not known. The incident for P6, which I will highlight, is this instrument here, and you can see whoop, it goes up and then starts to track with reservoir fluctuations, um, has been described, um, that, that flushing uh, operation was described as the operator placing his boot on top of the piezometer riser pipe and exclaiming, watch this, and he would um, shoot water out of the top of the instrument. Uh, height of the water has been described as much as 50 feet into the air, but the joke is kind of like the fish that every time you tell a story gets bigger. Um, so we're not really sure how tall that fountain of water came out, um, but it was more than it should have been, certainly. Um, as part of this piezometer flushing effort, uh, P6 began exhibiting anomalous behavior, as I pointed out on the time history uh, plot, and the water levels increased over 50 feet for 50 feet and remained responsive to pool fluctuations. So this was worrisome. Um, this at the time suggested that the embankment or the foundation may have been damaged during the flushing efforts. Um, on the time history plot, P6 is shown in red. 
Um, and you can see the 50 foot jump when it was flushed. P6A and P6B um, were then installed um, to try to uh, concern that this had been damaged and that perhaps there was damage done to the, the um, area around um, the structure and the embankment. Um, they're about 10 feet away and about approximately 10 feet higher than P6. And they were done to help verify that the higher head measured in P6 was of limited extent. Um, and they show that water levels are consistent with P6 before it was damaged. Sure. Yep. There's other notes on other instruments, but we're going to focus on P6 for the purpose of this case history. Um, so what our team did um, was we generated, and this was, we worked closely with Vicksburg districts. We had a great uh, civil engineer that worked out at the dam. Um, she was awesome, and she kept very close tabs on the instrumentation, and she had really good records, so that was a huge benefit to us. Um, so she, um, Tracy Phillips, actually generated these correlation plots that you see. Oops, keep hitting the wrong button um, here. Um, so we had that information, and you can see how, with the correlation plots, how they respond to changes in pool. Um, so you can see that this cluster down here was the pre-flushing um, P6, and these are the post-flushing P6. And um, you can see that it does correlate with um, with uh, up, you know, fluctuations in the reservoir with some scatter. Um, it also shows um, that difference, as I mentioned, pre and post clearing. And P6, just for awareness, if I didn't mention it before, sits right here. So it was drilled through the core. Um, we thought originally it was to be um, tipped in the foundation bedrock in sandstone, um, but I don't want to get ahead of myself because it's kind of a fun, fun story. Um, so another thing that the team had, that, that the district and, and the prior IES team had noticed was that there was a power tunnel, as I mentioned, that runs to um, along the right abutment of the dam, and it's periodically dewatered for inspections and maintenance. Um, and what they would observe uh, when they automated the instruments is when they were doing their dewatering cycle, they would see these instruments um, that are uh, tipped in that same vicinity reacting to um, those cycles of watering and dewatering um, for inspection and maintenance. So we knew that P6 um, had a hydraulic connection to pressurization and depressurization of the power tunnel, but that was first noticed in 2009, um, and that again was related to automation of the piezometers. And then this portion of the tunnel uh, does go through a layer of sandstone. So remember, we've got this overturned um, and thrust vaulted rock that is continuous more or less um, from abutment to abutment in, into the dam. So where we had that instrument and where we had um, the power tunnel reaction, um, there was a consistent sandstone bed between both. Um, and so that could be a likely source of connection between the tunnel and the piezometers. Um, so we got our group together in 2017. Um, a quantitative risk assessment was initiated and the team conducted a site visit in a PFMA several months later. Um, the team reviewed all the background information, reviewed instrumentation data, and identified missing records and data gaps. The team did identify um, that we had a lot of missing construction documentation um, and a lack of construction details for the piezometers. And there was also, um, from my perspective, a concern over functionality and reliability of the instruments. Um, so, and the piezometers specifically, and an unknown influence of regional artesian groundwater on project instrumentation. So remember, we're, as the crow flies, about 10 miles from Hot Springs, Arkansas. So cold and hot springs are common in the area and, 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 and uh, had, had some interesting discussions about that. One thing I will mention is when that group got together on site, um, and I'll also point out, I added this picture because it's probably one of the most beautiful uh, USACE visitor centers I've ever been in. Um, it looks like a hunting lodge. So if you ever if you ever visit Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, pop over to uh, Blakely Mountain Dam and check it out. So one day we're out there and we're a bunch of city kids. We're like, oh, look, there's deer out there. So we ran out and took pictures. So it's kind of a neat place. Um, but I was suspicious that there was something related to that flushing operation um, that either did the damage that we were concerned about and or might have caused damage to the instruments to where they weren't reliable anymore. So this is our event tree. Um, so our uh, failure mode that we were looking at, failure mode six, um, concentrated leak erosion around, um, along a hydraulic fracture was where we were moving. Um, as you can see, the first node uh, is for the flaw, 
And what we needed for our flaw is we needed to have an upstream downstream hydraulic fracture that would connect to the reservoir upstream and then go towards our gravel drain, which by the way, was not filter compatible. So we had an unfiltered exit into our gravel drain, which was also worrisome. Um, so the flaw node was our primary focus uh, for the non-invasive field investigation. And it was also um, scoped to gain a better understanding of the project instrumentation. Thank you, Dara. Um, so when we had that initial meeting, everyone comes in the room and like, all right, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna put in some more instruments? And I'm like, I'm not punching another hole into this dam until we figure out what's going on with this instrumentation. Number one, it costs a lot of money to get rigs out there. Um, and if we were really concerned about the um, structure being damaged, why would we punch another hole into it? I know we can drill and do no harm, but it didn't feel right. I felt like we needed to focus on that um, unusual instrumentation data. So what we did is we initially scoped a non-invasive field investigation. So due to limited piezometer construction details, a, um, we did a downhole camera inspection. We scoped a downhole camera inspection, um, and that was a relatively inexpensive way to verify construction. I also didn't mention that these piezometer pipes were tiny. Um, so we had, I think, smaller than a three-quarter ID piezometer riser pipe. Um, and you can buy commercial off-the-shelf um, downhole camera systems. We had one in Albuquerque District, but we didn't have something that, and it might have even been smaller. It might have been half inch because um, we tried to use our uh, downhole camera system and it wouldn't work. So we actually contracted with a marine um, diving company that, that will actually specially designed a camera system for us. And Vicksburg was happy to have it to work on their other projects too. Um, so we scoped that. Um, we wanted to verify construction details because we didn't have any information. Where's this? Where's the screen? Um, what's the condition of the pipes? Do we think that um, the filter pack is plugged potentially? Um, so we wanted to get an idea of general condition. Do we have broken riser pipes? Um, that was another theory we had about why is that instrument uh, tracking so high but still with the reservoir? Um, so. We wanted to use that information to verify that the pressure recorded in the um, piezometers was reliable and representative of the zone that the instruments were screened in and that the readings aren't being influenced by damage to the instrument. Water sampling and analysis um, was also scoped to provide, um, that may provide information about the embankment and foundation with regard to seepage and leakage sources, uh, whether it's reservoir and or regional groundwater or precipitation. Um, and, and, and those related paths. And we also wanted to verify if the foundation was fractured towards and or easily connected to that right abutment power tunnel um, and our pre-construction springs to the right of um, piezometer six. We also scoped slug testing um, as an effective means to determine the hydraulic connectivity of the formation in the immediate vicinity of the monitoring well and, and use that, to, um, it can also potentially give you an idea of how permeable the area that it's, you know, that, that sensing zone is versus what we expect it to be. And it can also be helpful to verify instrument functionality um, in the screened interval. So uh, first and foremost, we did a document search. Um, so the team had did have some success in locating additional information on the piezometers by finding some drill logs. Um, the logs located did not differentiate what materials were drilled through. Um, but the notes on P6 installation noted trouble um, with the PVC glue while sealing the riser pipe. It was also discovered that the foundation piezometers that were supposed to be screened in the rock, as I sort of almost told you earlier, um, were actually just above the foundation contact in the, in the lower portion of the embankment. And then this is a summary of our downhole camera survey results. So some instrument, instruments appeared to have clean screens with some sediment accumulated, but nothing too worrisome. Um, others had visible scale in the screened interval, um, and some were found to have cracked and damaged riser pipes. So we had a few hypotheses for the behavior of uh, piezometer six. Uh, these included pressures from the piezometer, flushing opened a joint in the riser pipe um, in the embankment, reading higher pressures in the embankment. Um, the piezometer screen could have been clogged. That uh, was a suspicion I had looking at the data. Um, or is there a hydrofracture through the core near the interface with the bedrock, uh, reading pressures at the upstream side of the core through an open fracture? Um, so I'm going to pause this case history now, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, groundwater um, next, and then we'll pick up this case history um, next. So are there any 
oh, wait, real quick, new projects, uh, just some notes on targeted instrumentation and monitoring. So new projects under design should consider an instrumentation program that will support monitoring during construction and during design uh, life of the project. And then there's some information um, for your, I won't go through it, uh, but just some more information in this slide deck uh, for, uh, that you can refer to as well. Some key takeaways. Um, Stating the obvious, I've harped on it enough, but teams should uh, will need to consider all historic data for um, their existing instrumentation. They should also consider the reliability of existing instrumentation and the data collected. Um, this can help identify gaps in the data and inform field investigations and also help bracket uncertainty as you move through uh, failure mode development. And then there's just a quick list of training if you don't have a lot of experience in instrumentation and you want to know more, I find it very interesting. Um, so there's a lot of good, uh, like I said, industry sponsored training as well as internal um, to uh, USACE. Uh, this prospect, this is an internal USACE uh, training, but I have not taken it myself, but I hear it's really good. They revamped it recently. So lots of good information on that one. And then some references 